With the New York Times in one hand and the Catechism of the Catholic Church in the other, Al Cresta is ready for conversations of consequence. A good Catholic is a faithful citizen. Make America great again! What's more important here is not saving the country, it's saving your soul. It's a bold strategy. Let's see if it pays off for us. Trust in the media has hit its lowest point. I want the truth! What is truth? The age of the passive layperson can't go on. It's our job to share that love of Christ with these people. This is an excellent mission, sir, with an extremely valuable objective. Broadcasting from the studios of Ave Maria Radio in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and taking a closer Catholic look at current events, issues, and ideas. This is Cresta in the Afternoon. Al, this is an excellent program. You have a wonderful show. I love listening in my car. That's a great question to start off with. You are in for a show tonight. Here we go again. Well, good afternoon. I'm Al Cresta. We're here in Naples, Florida at the uh, annual Legatus Summit. Uh, let me tell you what's coming up on today's program. Uh, if you noticed, there were some comments yesterday made about uh, 19, the George Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984, getting a new lease on life. It is shot to the top of Amazon's bestseller list this week after the, uh, the, the president's inaugural address and then the controversy over the numbers surrounding uh, who attended the inauguration and uh, his senior advisor, Kellyanne Conway, making a comment about, quote, alternative facts unfortunate phrase from uh, a woman who's usually much sharper and more precise than that but so people are now thinking that president trump's administration is to be feared as an authoritarian big brother type government that is going to manipulate the news media and i want to talk a little bit about that because if you want if you want a dystopian novel for the American future, it's not 1984. It's Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. And I'll tell you, it, our future will run much more akin to Huxley's expectation in what is actually the older of the two dystopian novels than Orwell's. Uh, Orwell's had a lot to do with uh, Stalinist communism. Huxley had a lot to do with imagining a hedonistic and technocratic utopia. I have some comments to make on that. Uh, on the other side of the news break. Yesterday, as soon as I got here, flipped on CNN to see what was happening. And I usually do a quick look at the news channels. There, the big story was, or the, the, what kept coming up over and over again, and it happened on Fox too, that George Orwell's book, 1984, uh, was published, I think, in 1949 or 1950. George Orwell's book, 1984 has shot to the top of Amazon's bestseller list this week. And the speculation is, well, that's because Orwell's novel is about this uh, totalitarian danger. He wrote it, of course, at the beginning of the Cold War, looking at Stalinist Russia. And it's a wonderful book. Orwell's a great writer, by the way. Uh, it was an interesting conversation between him and uh, I think it was Hilaire Bullock, uh, well, let me, oh no, excuse me, Evelyn Waugh, excuse me. He and Evelyn Waugh, the Catholic novelist, uh, had conversations about the faith. Orwell, to my knowledge, never really responded that positively to Catholicism. But uh, there are some interesting essays on how he evaluated the Catholic faith. That's beside the point. The point is, it's one of the great dystopian novels of the 20th century, 1984. Well, it, why did it shoot to the top of the bestseller list? Well, everybody thinks it's because of Mr. Trump, Donald, President Trump. That President Trump presents himself in a kind of totalitarian leader kind of light. You know, he's the, he's the strong man. He's the one who's going to get it done his way. And he'll manipulate the media. He'll uh, impose his way on people. And so you've got a lot of people who are politically to the left who are fear, claiming to be fearful that uh, we are going to see the rise of a new populist, uh, even Nazi-style uh, American politics. I don't see it myself. I see some. I see harshness. I see uh, careless remarks now and then. But I don't think there's any chance we're going to see the rise of an American fascism. It's. Don't have time to tell you exactly why. But let me tell you what would be a more appropriate. If you want to fear the future, don't fear 1984. 
Fear Brave New World. In 1984, Orwell, uh, you know, was warning about the co over, American liberties being taken over by a Stalinist type Russia. That was in 1948 that he wrote the book. In 1984, 1980, the, the, the scenario of 1984 was nowhere to be found in America or in Western Europe. By 1989, the Cold War was over. And, and uh, the, Orwell's vision of the future was nowhere to be seen. What we had, though, was a very different dystopian vision of the future. What Orwell feared, where we were going to have a society that would ban books, but in Huxley's Brave New World, the fear was that there'd be no reason to ban a book because there was going to be, well, was there going to be anybody who wanted to read a book. Orwell feared that uh, there were going to be people who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much information that we would be reduced to distraction and passivity. Orwell feared in 1984 that the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley, on the other hand, feared that the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. In 1984, Huxley feared that we would become a captive culture. Huxley, on the other hand, thought we would become a trivial culture. You see, uh, and this, this, these points are actually made very effectively in Neil Postman's 1985 book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. You know, Huxley... Excuse me, Orwell's society controlled us by inflicting pain. Huxley's society was controlled by allowing us to inflict pleasure upon ourselves. Uh, Orwell, gave us, Orwell gave us Big Brother, uh, an external oppressor. Huxley showed us how we would come to love our oppressor. That's more of where America is today. You know, in, in Huxley's vision of the world, we created ourselves. We, we were test tube babies. We were made to serve others. We had designer babies in Huxley's Brave New World. When a population becomes distracted by trivia, when cultural life is redefined as a perpetual round of entertainment, when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, when, in short, a, a people become an audience and their public business becomes a vaudeville act, then the nation does find itself at risk. And that's where we are today. Death of authentic culture is a possibility. So all this fear about um, uh, the American future being a future of externally opposed oppression by this totalitarian-style leader, I think, is malarkey. The much greater danger is that we will enslave ourselves by overemphasis on entertainment, by weaving an electronic cocoon around ourselves so we can be perpetually stimulated uh, through our eyes, our ears, our senses. Uh, the use of, we know just by the use of prescription, the abuse of prescription medication, the emphasis on uh, you know, drugs, uh, respectable drug taking, you might call it. And uh, this was all, Huxley warned about this. He had something in uh, Brave New World called Soma. It was a drug that you took. Uh, the emphasis there was on male female relationships were s full of sex without very much love at all. In fact, love was dangerous in Huxley's Brave New World. So when, when you hear. <laughs> When you hear, this is typical of our, our public discourse, always warning about the wrong danger. So, for instance, let's just shift gears a bit. Now we've got people claiming that Betsy DeVos of Michigan, who's been nominated as Secretary of Education, uh, President Trump would like her to be Secretary of Education, she's being uh, struck down, or excuse me, she's being uh, argued against, uh, you know, through a bunch of... Uh, a lot of fog has been put up around her. The truth is, the reason people don't like her, the reason the student, uh, the, the, the teachers' unions don't like her, is because she's an advocate of school choice. That's that's what it is. It's not. She's quite a capable woman. She may not have all the public school experience uh, some people might like, but her vision of education is very sound, and she deserves support in my estimation. She's a, a, an advocate of school choice, and that's a threat to the teachers' unions in America. 
the reason what has happened here is Americans have forgotten that education is fundamentally a religious and spiritual enterprise. It's about the formation of kids in three areas character, community, and content. And those are fundamentally religious pursuits. The development of character is about virtue. That's a religious and spiritual enterprise. The passing on of content isn't just facts. It's the formation of a world view, a way of understanding the facts and putting them in proper uh, religious and spiritual context. And the building of community is a spiritual exercise. Catholics should know this above all because of our emphasis upon the body of Christ, this uh, a new pi the pilot plant of the new humanity that Jesus instituted, the body of Christ, the international community that exists to bear witness to the coming kingdom of God. Content has to do with worldview and facts. Character has to do with virtue and our obligation to one another. Community has to do with how ought we to order our lives together. Those are not merely philosophical questions, they're deeply spiritual questions. Betsy DeVos knows that the government shouldn't have a monopoly on education funding. It is the most fundamental right of parents to raise up their children in the way they should go. And that's because education is a re a fundamentally a religious and spiritual enterprise, something the government's never been very good at. We don't like to leave spiritual enterprises to Caesar, do we? I'm Al Creston.